Ladies and gentlemen, salam, uh, good morning and good noon. Uh, some of you are in different parts of the world. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We will be discussing cyber cognitive warfare and influence operation. Uh, I'm Dr. Shfaq Ahmed, serving as an assistant professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations, University of Sargoda. On behalf of the University of Sargoda and the Institute of uh, Regional Studies, Islamabad, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event. Um, I wish to uh, thank the President and Strategic Communication Officer, Ms. Rima Shokat, Institute of Regional Studies, for agreeing to organize this collaborative event. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Professor Dr. Rabi Akhtar from University of Lahore for sparing out time uh, for her busy schedule, from her busy schedule to deliver her scholarly lecture. And I, I, I want to extend my gratitude uh, to Professor Dr. Mino uh, Yoon, uh, our South Korean scholar for being with us uh, for his uh, important lecture. Uh, now I will introduce uh, Ambassador Nadeem Riaz. He is the current president of Institute of Regional Studies, Islamabad. He is a former diplomat who worked at Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Pakistan for 35 years. He holds master's degree in international relations from Columbia University, New York, United States. He has held key uh, positions at the headquarters, including Director Europe, Director Administration, Director Foreign Services Academy, and additional Foreign Secretary to Europe. He has served as an ambassador to Italy. Uh, he has also served as an ambassador to Sweden, Finland, Estonia, and Latvia. He was a regular speaker at American University Rome, uh, Loyola University Rome, and number of various uh, and member of various other universities and uh, research institutions. He is author of Handbook for Diplomats of Pakistan VIP Protocols. Now I will request Mr. Ambassador for opening remarks. Uh, over to you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much. I know you've been very kind with the introduction. Um, um, but, uh, today's subject is something I think which is extremely important. And um, I think uh, it, it's more important to understand the actual concept behind it. Um, you know, because uh, as, if you look at warfare in contemporary times, uh, warfare has undergone a major change or rather a transformation. And uh, now it is technology, it is psychological, it's uh, all this uh, basically converging to shape the basic fabric of uh, the world today. Um, the concept of cyber cognitive warfare basically harnesses the incredible potential of cyber technologies. It offers unprecedented avenues to influence control and even undermine adversaries uh, in ways the normal conventional uh, uh, warfare did not. And today warfare is not really confined to, to physical territories. It extends to the cognitive domain through the strategic use of digital tools. Um, the essence of cognitive warfare is basically a paradigm where there is the ability to control the flow of information and the cognition becomes a formidable form of projecting. Well, if you try to deconstruct the term cognitive warfare, cognitive basically stems from cognition and it pertains to the mental processes governing our comprehension world uh, involves the notions of conflict, uh, armed contention among states or any. But in a sense, the boundaries between the stakeholders in today's world have dimensions have become a bit fluid. The statehood and the traditional definitions. Of so what is cognitive warfare? It is a multifaceted fusion of cyber information. 
motivation, psychological abilities, when combined with other instruments of power, have the potential to change attitudes or shape attitudes or behaviors and basically create strategic advantages. It is just more than basically controlling the flow of information, people's reaction to the information which is provided. It involves triggering internal conflicts and contradiction within adversaries, causing them to basically unravel from within. It is as such an unconventional form of warfare that uses cyber tools to alter enemies' cognitive processes, exploit the mental biases or reflexive thinking and provoke two distortions and try to influence decisions which may or may not hinder the actions may or may not have negative effects at both individual as well as at the collective level. Obviously, tackling cognitive warfare poses a number of challenges. Basically, because it can, it is termed as the minds of people and the population and has the ability to cause confusion in mayhem and unrest and distort the actual reality. It also propose, it also possesses both advantages as well as this. And if we look at the disadvantages, they can be that it is relatively low risk compared to the traditional military actions. The tactics which are involved to achieve the various objectives can actually attain them without using kinetic measure. So in today's interconnected world, the, the advantage of cognitive warfare could be that it basically spreads the information very rapidly. This could be termed as an advantage and also as a disadvantage because it actually transgresses the borders and influences opinions on much larger scale than conventional means. Obviously, compared to traditional military spendings, uh, the spendings on cognitive warfare are much less, but the capabilities of it are much more. Um, so, the proponents of it I mean, this can again be argued that they feel that like, you know, through this, a lot of resources can then be made available and they can be directed towards healthcare, towards education, infrastructure, in infrastructure development. But this is again, I mean, it's, it's, it's on which side uh, uh, of uh, the coin you are looking at. I mean, is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? But its disadvantages are very clear because it creates disinformation, disinformation, manipulation, builds false narratives, creates confusion and mistrust. Talking about the truth and propaganda, but while there are no kinetic measures, and basically, we are talking about nonviolent means, but they do have the potential of escalating towards kinetic and towards moving in such a way that it can basically lead to conflict if the flow of information is not carefully managed. In my opinion, Cyber cognitive warfare is here to stay because with every passing day, technologies are continuing to increase, and so are the tools and the methods of kinetic warfare, so cognitive warfare 
on the increase. And the operations with every passing day are becoming more. So this basically poses the challenge of staying ahead of these threats and ensuring the security of digital space. Most important thing is that there is greater need for awareness about this lethal tool, which can cause a lot of damage. The future is likely to see increased efforts to regulate and establish norms of cyber cognitive warfare. International cooperation would take place and it and I think it would be uh, crucial to create frameworks to establish the various, uh, uh, some sort of laws, which I think would be very important to, to, to actually take things forward. Uh, and lastly, cyber cognitive warfare uh, basically uh, influences operations that are shaping the way conflicts play out in our digital age. And it is, uh, it is basically up to us to stay informed and, re and remain prepared for the challenges which are in front of us. And by understanding these concepts, a lot of these concepts are are, are there. Uh, I think uh, we have to navigate the digital battleground or the battlefield more effectively and take more informed decision in an ever-changing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, uh, for enlightening us about the cognitive warfare and the weaponization of the mind. Um, and uh, now, uh, now, I will refer to uh, Dr. Ravi Akhtar, but before that, um, uh, let me please introduce uh, Professor Dr. Ravi Akhtar. Uh, she is currently Director of Center for Security Strategy and Policy Research, University of Lahore. She is the founding director of the School of uh, uh, Integrated Social Sciences at uh, University of Lahore, Pakistan. Dr. Akhtar was a member of Prime Minister's Advisory Council on Foreign Affairs from 2018 to 2022. She is a non-resident senior fellow at this uh, South Asia Center, Atlantic Council, uh, Washington, DC. Dr. Akhtar holds a PhD in security studies from Kansas State University. She is a Fulbright alumina. Uh, and Dr. Akhtar received um, her master's in international relations from Kaidiyadam University, Islamabad. And her master's in political science from uh, Eastern Illinois University, USA. She has written extensively on South Asian uh, nuclear security and difference dynamics. She is author of a book titled The Blind Eye, uh, U.S. Non-Proliferation Policy Towards Pakistan from Ford to Clinton. Uh, Dr. Akhtar is also the editor of Pakistan Politico, Pakistan's first strategic and uh, foreign affairs magazine. Uh, uh, over to you, Dr. Akhtar. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum everybody. It's always a pleasure uh, listening to Ambassador Nadeem Riaz. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ashfaq, um, for having me here. And uh, hello to my fellow panelists, Dr. Yoon. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to this webinar on uh, cyber cognitive warfare and influence operations, which is jointly organized by University of Sargodha and IRS. Um, the field of digital communication and information technology, it is uh, evolving rapidly. And with it, the methods of warfare, as Investor Nadeem Riaz mentioned, are also changing. The rise of social media platforms has given way to the ability to manipulate public opinion and influence thought processes through the use of targeted messages and propaganda. And we all know that in today's interconnected world, the prevalence of information technology and social media has led to the emergence of new forms of conflict and warfare. 
two such con concepts that you have picked for today's webinar are influence operations and cognitive warfare. And these techniques are used to manipulate public opinion, destabilize governments, and interfere with the democratic processes. And I'm glad that we are discussing these topics here today. I believe the term influence operation, it refers to a range of activities intended to shape the perceptions, beliefs, and behaviors of not only individuals, but entire groups. This can be changed, achieved through a variety of means, including the dissemination of the propaganda, the use of social media bots and trolls that we are all so familiar with, and the creation of false news stories. Influence operations are often used to amplify existing divisions within societies, exploit cultural or religious differences, or undermine trust in democratic institutions. As for cognitive warfare, and something to which Ambassador Nadim has also alluded to, it is a more sophisticated and targeted form of influence operation. This technique involves the use of psychological tactics to manipulate an opponent's decision-making processes, often in the context of military or geopolitical conflicts. Cognitive warfare can take many forms, including the use of disinformation campaigns, the manipulation of public sentiment, and the deployment of psychological operations against enemy forces. Some of the key factors which I believe are important driving the rise of influence operations and cognitive warfare are the increasing use of social media and other digital technologies, the globalization of the entire communication networks, and the growing importance of cultural and ideological conflicts in global affairs. Additionally, I believe while many of these tactics have traditionally been associated with state actors, there is increasing evidence to suggest that non-state actors, including extremist groups and criminal organizations are also using these methods to achieve their objectives. I will now refer to our region in this context. So South Asia is one of the regions where these tactics have been employed with frequency and sophistication. The region is home to multiple border disputes, historical conflicts and strained relationships between neighboring countries which makes it particularly fertile ground for influence operations. In recent years, we have seen instances of coordinated disinformation campaigns, social media manipulation, and cyber attacks aimed at creating chaos in the social fabric of a society and creating counter narratives that are both negative and false. You're all familiar with the EU Disinfo Lab, which exposed a disinformation campaign conducted by India against Pakistan. Termed Indian Chronicles, this operation has spanned over a decade uh, and it has involved the vast network of over 750 plus media outlets, NGOs, think tanks, and fictitious entities. The extent of this operation was staggering and, and none of us you know, could have fathomed as to how uh, huge this operation was, aiming to establish a media ecosystem that advanced a pro-India narrative while discrediting Pakistan on a global scale. The operation entailed the creation and dissemination of deceptive news websites, social media accounts, and forced documents to propagate a narrative portraying Pakistan as a sponsor of terrorism and human rights violator. These fictitious entities I like to remind our audience, often assume the names of Western organizations, or they either pretended to be EU institutions masquerading as legitimate entities. Now, through this guise, they gained access to policymaking circles in the EU, exerting influence over the foreign policies of the European nations. One notable aspect of this information campaign was the exploitation of the UNHCR, the United Nations Human Rights Council itself. And the network amplified the voice of dubious NGOs, applying pressure and disseminating information uh, to discredit Pakistan while highlighting India's purported commitment uh, to democracy and peace. Moreover, this uh, disinformation campaign involves a coordinated effort to manipulate the Wikipedia pages as well, including numerous entries that were related to Pakistan and its leaders. For more than a decade, this network of fabricated media outlets and entities meticulously edited Wikipedia, some of which I'm sure all of you consumed as well as information source, distorting facts and creating a pro-India narrative. 
there exists the the kind of you know extensive scale of india's disinformation campaign against pakistan underscores the need for media literacy and the significance of verifying the authenticity of the information that you're receiving unchecked operations of this nature can yield significant consequences including heightened tension and potential damage to international relations broadly so now i'll come to the last part of my talk where you know what can we as academics or the policy community do to deal with this disinformation propaganda campaign that has been aimed um, that has that had aimed at discrediting pakistan i believe that it is you know it requires a multifaceted and strategic approach so firstly i believe that we need to elevate public awareness and media literacy and we aren't doing enough we need to launch nationwide campaigns to educate the public about recognizing and countering disinformation we need to promote media literacy and critical thinking skills to empower our citizens to identify fake news and verify information from credible sources we also ever since you know this has uh, broken out there is no national response to this um dossier that we had even presented at various un agencies we need to create a dedicated team within government agencies comprised of communication experts analysts cyber security specialists academics to monitor and respond quickly to disinformation campaigns we can't just afford to sit another 15 years uh waiting for a foreign entity to unearth um these campaigns against pakistan and this team i believe should be equipped to fact check and provide accurate information real time we also need to strengthen cyber security uh measures to to protect government websites social media accounts and critical infrastructure from hacking and cyber attacks we need to promote digital diplomacy develop a proactive uh digital diplomacy strategy that utilizes official social media channels and platforms to counter these false narratives we need to engage with our international partners we need to collaborate with other countries uh that are also affected by this information campaign so that we get to share uh not only insights but also data and best practices for countering disinformation so that we could have a coordinated effort to expose false narratives we also in pakistan need to foster fact checking and verification we need to establish partnership with these fact checking organizations to verify information and debunk fake news and while we are at it and we are doing and we need to devise all these strategies i think we need to amplify positive narratives about pakistan from within we need to highlight pakistan's achievements culture contributions on the international stage through positive narratives we need to focus on show showcasing the country's strength and progress even today when i travel i'm horrified when somebody you know asks me whether pakistan has mcdonalds or kfc uh, outlets um you know it, it shows as to you know despite our best efforts and putting our best foot forward and international collaborations and presence uh, we are still being asked this question as if you know we live in some cave um i also do believe that we need to be transparent in our reporting mechanisms we need to establish mechanisms for reporting instances of disinformation which occur both domestically as well as internationally and we need to provide regular updates on efforts taken to counter these campaigns in pakistan we also need to support independent journalism we need to uh you know support credible and ethical media outlets that adhere to responsible reporting practices we need to encourage investigative journalism to expose false narratives and disinformation and i cannot emphasize this enough that this is not only government's responsibility uh civil society and ngos in pakistan needs to be engaged need to collaborate together in order to have an all uh, have a all hands on deck approach um and lastly i think you know there need to be more legal and regulatory measures uh we should consider enacting or strengthening regulations that address the spread of disinformation propaganda and we also need to ensure that any regulations uphold freedom of expression while holding those responsible for deliberate uh misinformation accountable 
So addressing India's disinformation propaganda campaigns requires a coordinated effort across government agencies, civil society, media, and academia. And I am sure that by implementing these measures, Pakistan can work to effectively counter false narratives and safeguard its reputation on the international stage. And as academics, I believe it is crucial for us to understand the tactics that nation states and non-state actors will continue to use to influence public perception and manipulate information online. And I'm hopeful that through seminars like these, we will be able to generate useful insights and understandings of cyber cognitive warfare and highlight the challenges that policymakers and government agencies face in the fight against this ever evolving and dynamic threat. Um, we have a long way to go. I would like to end here and I'll be looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Rabia, uh, for giving us the brief introduction about uh, what is cognitive warfare and then focusing on South Asia and then providing us the uh, policy recommendation that we will have to work upon it. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Now we have Professor Ayun uh, and uh, it's a great player to have uh, uh, Dr. Amino Yun. Uh, now, a brief introduction, and then I will not uh, be a hurdle between you and his scholarly lecture. Uh, Professor Dr. Amino Yun, um, he holds a PhD in criminal justice and also a PhD in international politics. He is serving as a full professor at the Department of Police, Science, and Security Studies at uh, Gachin University. Uh, professor Amino is a research fellow at Seoul National University Asia Center. Republic of Korea from 2020 to present day. He is also the present chairperson of uh, New Technology and Cybersecurity Committee, uh, the Korean Association of International Studies, Republic of Korea. Professor Yun was a research fellow at the Center of Analysis uh, uh, of International Relations, Baku, Azerbaijan, where I met him. Um, and uh, he's a consultant. Um, he's a consultant for South Korean National Police Agency. Bureau for Counterterrorism from 2016 to present. He also served in a capacity of consultant for the Department of State in the U.S. Embassy at Seoul from 2017 to 2018. He is the Director of Counterterrorism uh, Center and Chief Hostage Negotiator, Korea Crisis Management uh, Service from 2017 uh, to present day. He has served as a constant, uh, as a consultant for the South Korean National Police Agency Bureau of Foreign Affairs and Counter Espionage from 2016 to 2019. Professor Yuno has a long CV and uh, numerous achievements. Uh, and I don't want to be a cause of delay between you and his lecture. Uh, they will, therefore, I will stop here. Uh, over to you, Professor Yuno. Hello, everybody, and uh, uh, thanks for our invitation. So I'm so happy to share. Uh, our experience in the uh, Republic of Korea uh, with uh, my uh, Pakistani colleagues. And this is a great opportunity for me. Uh, cyber cognitive warfare and uh, influence operation. Uh, I, I basically like to share uh, our current experience in South Korea. Uh, then uh, uh, you guys uh, will understand what's going on here. So here I like to address, you know, the experience we are facing right now is quite similar uh, to that of yours. So uh, uh, it's uh, we, we we may uh, you know learn uh, together a lot by sharing this information. Uh, actually, South Korea recognized uh, just recently. Uh, we are facing uh, influence operation and cognitive warfare threat uh, from uh, North Korea and, and China. So uh, we are more and more aware of this uh, uh, threat and uh, we are focusing uh, this issue. So recently uh, we are uh, having an international uh, seminar with uh, our European colleagues so EU uh, uh, sent a couple of delegates and uh, we had uh, a very uh, uh, productive meetings 
in our Korean uh, Institute of Defense Analysis. Uh, so uh, Europeans, they are uh, now they are working on a new concept called FIMI, uh, meaning foreign uh, foreign inter uh, information, foreign information manipulation inter uh, intervention. So basically, they are focusing on Russian and Chinese threat. So each each, each country uh, may have uh, different uh, threats, but Basically, nature of threat uh, and and you know the tactics how to cut force is quite similar. So that's what we are focusing on. And uh, U.S. they uh, you know they raised the issue of this uh, concept of cognitive uh, warfare back in uh, 2019, and they are substantially developing this issue and. Uh, now U.S. is focusing on uh, uh, Russian East, Russian threat as well as Chinese threat. So uh, we are cooperating with uh, U.S. as well uh, 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 against China and Chinese uh, influence operation. So that's what we are doing. And last year, actually, Korean army uh, first recognized this uh, influence operation threats. And then they uh, 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 they printed out uh, this uh, military manual uh, on uh, cognitive warfare. That's our uh, first movement in our military. So we are quite uh, recent. And then 2022 and 2023 this year. So we are working on. So nowadays, uh, we have many uh, media reports uh, reporting uh, North Korean uh, influence operation against uh, South Korean society and the public. And it became uh, like a scandals around the country. Then also we, you know, our uh, South Korean public uh, realized that there's a substantial uh, influence operation threat from China. So we have a couple of media reports uh, on uh, Chinese uh, Confucius uh, Institute. Uh, they are the main center of this uh, influence operation around the country. Then also uh, we, uh, we, we found out Chinese, uh, they are running a secret police uh, inside uh, South Korea. Uh, they are basically spreading uh, pro-Chinese propaganda and uh, also uh, uh, harassing uh, anti-Chinese uh, individuals, uh, movement and uh, individuals here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our uh, the police agency and uh, intelligence uh, officers, uh, they are investigating uh, these uh, scandals, but uh, I mean, unfortunately, we don't have a proper law. That's the uh, main, main problem in this country. So we are basically working on this. Recently, uh, one of our uh, legislators, and he uh, proposed a new, uh, new bill, um, basically targeting on uh, foreign uh, information operations. So we we don't know yet. Uh, it's 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 under uh, discussion in our uh, legis legislative body, but we are not sure uh, at this point if it, it, it may become fully uh, legalized or not. But anyway, this is uh, the our position uh, today right now. So why, uh, uh, basically, uh, I try to introduce why Korea is facing, uh, well, North Korea is no surprise, you know, for the last 70 years, we are, you know, fighting against with each other, not only kinetic warfare, but also psychological warfare. So it's it's going on. So it's not, it's not uh, quite a surprising issue. But why China is uh, targeting South Korea? That's what I like to address. Uh, to my Pakistani colleagues. Chinese, uh, their uh, global strategy is basically, uh, they uh, try to uh, uh, achieving uh, multipolar world order. 
they are uh, not happy with uh, U.S. read uh, unipolar global uh, global uh, order. So uh, they try to uh, uh, withdraw uh, U.S. influence from uh, uh, Asia, uh, Asia and Pacific. And they try to divide uh, the globe uh, with a separate, uh, uh, different civilization zones, basically. So and they are thinking uh, Chinese uh, leading uh, one, uh, one civilization sphere and U.S. leading a uh, Western civilization sphere and Russian leading a uh, you know, civilization sphere and, and such and such. So basically they are uh, try to regain uh, uh, old fashioned uh, Chinese empire uh, regional world order. So they are looking at this region and China, Beijing is the center and South Korea is one of these uh, vessel state. Uh, around being uh, this, uh, you know, center, uh, Chinese center. So basically, uh, they try to withdraw uh, U.S. forces from South Korea. That's what they try to do. And then, uh, and they, if they can, and they, you know, they uh, unify uh, Taiwan and then also uh, Western Pacific, and they try to project their uh, influence, including military force. To do so, uh, they need to uh, obtain this, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, mutually assured destruction, uh, destruction capability uh, against the U.S. By doing so, they need to uh, 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 occupy entire Korean Peninsula and also uh, surrounding waters of Korean Peninsula, including the uh, Sea of Japan and. Uh, you know, uh, East Asia, East Chinese Sea and uh, uh, West Sea. It's called uh, the uh, we 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 our Koreans call the West Sea. The the water uh, south from uh, Korean Peninsula, uh, in between uh, China and uh, uh, South Korea. Anyhow, and why are they trying to do so and they need to uh, uh, send their SSBNs uh, up, up to the North Pole. Uh, then this uh, Arctic water and they try to run this, uh, their nuclear submarines. Then there can be a uh, quite effective countermeasures uh, against the US and such and such. They also uh, focusing on this Northern Sea Route uh, in a way of building this uh, Chinese uh, sphere of influence. They have this uh, quite uh, popular strategy it's called Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, this uh, nor northern route is uh, their third, third uh, route to connect to Europe, uh, including uh, this uh, Silk Road and, uh, and then uh, the southern route uh, via Indian Sea. So that's what they try to do. But basically, uh, kinetic uh, measures is not proper for China, China because South Korea is quite a uh, strong military uh, power and uh, economic power. So basically, uh, by using uh, kinetic uh, measures, China uh, have difficulty to, uh, you know, uh, 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 I'll say, uh, difficulty to, uh, 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 um, obtain uh, South Korea into uh, a Chinese sphere of influence. So uh, this uh, influence operation is a quite effective uh, way China chose. Under this uh, 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 global strategy, and they have this uh, cognitive, cognitive warfare or uh, influence operation grand strategy, it was designed uh, back in uh, 1999. So it has been for 20 years old, more than 20 years old. China, they call uh, the Chohanjun, uh, meaning unrestrictive warfare. It's quite similar to a uh, uh, Western concept of cognitive warfare. When Chinese say uh, unrestrictive warfare, meaning they use all measures to enforce their uh, 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 their uh, national agenda or their strategic work. So basically, uh, this uh, under the concept of this uh, unrestricted warfare, 
uh, organized crime and uh, migration and also cyber propaganda and disinformation and cultural warfare and fabrication of history and cultural propaganda and all these are, are, are included. So basically, uh, South Korea is now under threat of all this uh, uh, total approach uh, from Chinese side. In the course of this, uh, we are now observing uh, Chinese unrestricted warfare operation, both online and offline. Uh, in, in, in offline, and we are a growing number of Chinese uh, uh, students and uh, Chinese scholars inside South Korea. And under the, uh, based on uh, the report, and I cannot uh, you know, identify the source, but uh, based on the report and uh, the, this uh, Chinese official uh, sent from uh, Chinese Ministry of Education, and he's uh, stationed in the Chinese embassy in Seoul. He controls, uh, entire Chinese students uh, in South Korea. So these Chinese students are organized into uh, different sections uh, regarding different uh, regions, and then they are further uh, structured in each uh, universities. So basically, uh, whenever uh, issues comes out and they are operate quite, uh, you know, uh, as organized force. And also this Confucius Institute is quite well structured. And it, it is a, uh, one of the platform uh, to uh, uh, practice their influence operation inside, in, inside South Korea. And uh, uh, universities, uh, we identified the 23 universities around the country is uh, hosting, uh, they are host of this uh, Chinese Confucius Institute. The money comes from uh, China directly, so uh, universities quite depend on this uh, Chinese money. Uh, beyond that, this uh, each uh, university, uh, Confucius uh, institution in each university is platform for regional operation inside Korea. So this uh, Confucius Institute in the in the university is further connected to uh, high schools and local. Uh, Chinese uh, 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 language uh, teaching institute and uh, uh, elementary schools and even uh, this uh, you know kindergarten. So it's quite quite well structured. So around the nation, uh, uh, more uh, thousands of these uh, uh, you know platforms are, are now operating. It's quite difficult to uh, you know uh, work against this and. and and also they are corrupting our politicians, not everyone though, but you know, we are finding some cases and also uh, our scholars are, are under uh, influence on this. And also their uh, Chinese money is uh, um, you know, infiltrating our you know, uh, cultural industry, it's called the Hallyu, uh, you know, and they are basically uh, you know, uh, uh, supporting uh, money uh, to uh, uh, making uh, these uh, dramas and movies. So uh, in, in this, uh, uh, in, in, in script of these uh, dramas and movie, uh, they are, uh, you know, deliberately uh, yeah, putting this Chinese uh, cultural influence. You know. So it's it's all uh, become quite, you know, uh, coordinated uh, structures. And also online, and they are uh, doing this, uh, you know, fake news and uh, or disinformation operations. Also, these uh, comments, you know, in each case, and then uh, uh, a lot of comments are uh, 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 shown uh, on internet. And we call this uh, decal, and uh, you know, it's like, a, you know, there's each uh, there are a, a report, a media report, and then the, you know. Uh, uh, many indiv individuals put a comment, and uh, we found out that uh, these uh, commenters are quite well organized, also under the you know uh, 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 coordinated uh, you know uh, 
coordination from a Chinese center. So it's quite, you know, organized questions. So how we are uh, dealing with this is quite difficult. And uh, so I uh, recently, uh, uh, public, uh, uh, I recently published, uh, make a publication on this uh, cyber cognitive warfare. And so basically uh, we are focusing on this and uh, we are working on it. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed, excuse me, how many minutes uh, I have more? Uh, you can wrap it up in uh, five minutes. Uh, like then we will be having a question answer session because uh, Dr. Rabia has to uh, join another session. Uh, she will be busy. Uh... Okay, yep. I will wrap it up. So uh, basically uh, here, uh, uh, because of this uh, time limits, I cannot discuss uh, quite details on uh, cyber cognitive operation. But however, uh, I like to address this uh, new concept of cyber cognitive warfare is a more integrative way. It, in it includes psychological warfare, information warfare, and strategic communication, and also uh, uh, you know, other concepts. So basically, this one uh, try to uh, occupy human domain, uh, try to influence how human perceives and uh, things. Eventually, it focus on uh, a change of behaviors for uh, uh, human actors. So it is quite uh, uh, integrative and intensive approach. So we like to develop uh, particular measures. As South Korea now, we are actually develop, uh, developing this. Uh, Strategies, uh, strategies, and tactical measures on this cognitive warfare quite, you know, substantially. So I'm working on this uh, uh, development now. Thank you very much for, uh, you know, my time. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Professor Yun, um, uh, for you know for, for expressing uh, and uh, highlighting the uh, the aspects of. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the cognitive warfare or the cultural warfare, you have uh, basically counted uh, seven to eight different aspects of uh, the cognitive warfare that has been launched against South Korea. Um, now we will be uh, looking forward to Q&A uh, session and uh, let's see uh, who is having question. Um, to those who wants to uh, ask question, please uh, post them in the chat uh, window. Uh, so we will be, you know, uh, so so the, the speakers will be addressing your question then. Okay, um, uh, a, a question to both of you, uh, Professor Yoon and Professor Akhtar. Uh, like, uh, we have talked about this cognitive warfare and uh, what is the doctrine of cognitive warfare? Like from a Chinese perspective, uh, from South Korean perspective to Professor Yoon and uh, Professor Akhtar, uh, what, uh, what is the doctrine uh, that, that uh, India is having against Pakistan, the cognitive warfare doctrine? basic features of cognitive warfare doctrine. Uh, is there any doctrine? Thank you. Um, if I if I may um, show these warfares that are happening and the changing nature of warfare uh, is not a written doctrine. Uh, it is constantly evolving. Uh, but what I will say with respect to India and Pakistan, uh, in, in India's case, uh, since we got to learn that this strategy was made 15 years ago and the entire influence operation uh, based on this cognitive warfare, um, you know, worked for 15 years seamlessly, uh, tells you that there is a strategy. So while there might not be a doctrine, there was a strategy. And uh, like I said, uh, it continues to uh, you know, depend on various factors as to how hostile your relations are um, you know, to corner Pakistan at, the, you know, at many of the international forums and paint Pakistan in a picture uh, where it becomes isolated and a pariah state. Um, I think all of these features that I mentioned in my talk are 
uh, features that uh, you know Pakistan does not have a playbook against because Pakistan is an election uh, you know agenda item in India, but never would you hear uh, any of the Pakistani politicians using India in uh, as an election agenda item. Uh, it's not part of their manifestos as well. Kashmir is where we restrict ourselves to. And we do not strategize, um, you know, uh, these influence operations. Uh, so we, I think, do need to learn from, you know, what we have suffered all these years, Pakistan's, um, you know, position in FATF and as to how now Pakistan has gotten out of FATF and as to how damaging uh, the propaganda against Pakistan has been as a state, uh, painting Pakistan as a state which is sponsoring terrorism. All of this needs to be dealt with. And like I said, it has to be a, a, a collected, concerted effort. It cannot just be government dealing with it or strategizing for it. Uh, so again, just to answer your question, while there might not be a written doctrine, uh, we have seen enough uh, uh, you know, elements of it to suggest that there has been a strategy uh, by India which has been put in place to discredit Pakistan. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Inns, uh, it's basically a uh, Chinese uh, emphasized, you know, uh, unrestricted warfare. That means, you know, there's no limits. You know, you can use anything necessary to, you know, enforce your, you know, your will. Basically, a uh, country's agenda. So it's uh, constantly evolving. So as a doctor uh, uh, Ravi said, and it's a constantly evolving. So uh, it, it's it's like uh, uh, plastic, you know. The, the shapes are constantly changing. So, but here I like to address narratives. Narratives is very important uh, in in cognitive warfare or uh, influence operation. Narrative is uh, the weapons. You know, cognitive warfare is a war between uh, weaponized narratives. Narratives is a storytelling, and uh, but uh, more than storytelling, it includes ideology, histories, and, and myth, and, and everything. Uh, structures is like that. When Chinese say uh, China need to, uh, you know, uh, regain their uh, prestige, because in in the past, in the past, uh, China was great empire. Uh, all things were good. All things were great. Such as you know Ming Dynasty or or you know Tang Dynasty, you know, and then uh, th this uh, glorious uh, uh, time, then suddenly uh, the Europeans came, the Westerners came, and Westerners uh, humiliated us. So for the last hundred years, it was age of humiliation for Chinese. Then we have to get over, overcome this. Uh, humiliation, uh, we need to uh, achieve great empire again and they become glorious Chinese. Okay, that story uh, along with this uh, timeline, that story actually, actually have a powerful, uh, powerful power, powerful effect. Then they are developing these, uh, you know, narratives, enforcing other countries. Okay, look, Non-Westerners, including uh, maybe Pakistan, maybe uh, South Korea, you know, look, non-Westerners, all your humiliation, all your anger, all your, uh, uh, you know, uh, failures are uh, because of this Westerners, especially U.S. The, it's an evil empire. So get rid of the U.S. and then we can be great again as uh, Asians. But they don't, uh, they don't tell this sphere of Asia is done by Chinese center. They don't say that. But this narrative is very important that, that, that actually works. Putin used the same uh, similar narratives, okay? Once we were great empire, and now oh, we are humiliated by Westerners, then in the future, we, can, we, we gain great empire again, you know? So these narratives is very important. So it is basically, you have to restructure how your Pakistani narratives uh, can motivate and defend from, uh, you know, uh, foreign narratives. 
So this is a quite important idea. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, now we are having a question uh, from uh, my student, uh, Muzamil. Uh, uh, and he, he writes that uh, uh, it was a great session by respected professors. I have a question uh, that what role this cognitive warfare is playing in US-China uh, equation? Uh, like, uh, this is the question. Um, so, Uh, we see that our global order is shaped by the uh, competition between U.S. and China. How these countries are using this doctrine of cognitive warfare to influence other states? Hello, can I can I answer this question? And then yes, sure. obviously we'd love to love to hear Professor Yoon's uh, reply to this as well. Uh, sure. So. Uh, Muzamil, thank you so much. I think it's a great question. Um, uh, so in, in my conversations, you know, with uh, with some of the, uh, you know, scholars in, in Australia or some in Europe who are threatened, uh, you know, or, or are faced with this uh, problem of choosing a side and do a balancing act between the U.S. and China uh, because they are both heavily dependent on both countries. Um, are conflicted, you know, with the problem of the narratives. Um, so while you consume a lot of information that comes out from the U.S., uh, because U.S. is the hub of research, a lot of publication happens in the U.S. about the global power competition. And the narrative, as Professor Yoon said, is shaped around that global power competition. Uh, so my question to um, uh, these, uh, you know, colleagues has been that how many times has China, you know, directly uh, threatened uh, one or the other countries uh, enough for you to, you know, make a decision about joining military coalitions against China. Uh, and if you see the literature that is coming out from China, uh, you know, it is predominantly about a peaceful region so that China could rise economically. And, you know, military confrontation goes against the very grain and nature of the power status that China aspires from, for. So, so when you read literature that is coming out from the West, it is going to paint a picture of China as if the war is going to happen tomorrow. And if you read the literature that's coming out of China, you would, uh, you know, you would think that, you know, is anybody from the West even reading as to what the Chinese are writing? I understand that the language is a hurdle, is a hurdle, and and not many translations of the academic work coming out from China is available. But it seems like these are two separate conversations that are happening in two different worlds, right? And and so which narrative are you going to pick up and, and what are you going to believe? So I would suggest that keep objectivity about it while you do read that a global power competition is happening between US and China. Please deconstruct that narrative to see as to how closely coordinated these economies are. And until and unless very, very large scale decoupling happens between the United States and China, they're not going to go to war. There is just too much at stake, too much at risk. So, um, so I'm not going to say that this is fake news or this is disinformation. Obviously, it's based on heightened security uh, calculations, strategic calculations that these countries have done. Uh, but for you as a student or as a scholar or as an academic or policy expert, I think it is important to take a 360 degree view uh, and then, um, then uh, you know, make your own calculations about it as to what's actually happening. You know, whether these threat perceptions are for real, uh, are some of them, uh, you know, a conjecture. Uh, so be skeptical about the knowledge that uh, you're receiving by reading uh, articles uh, coming from both sides, and then and then decide on it. So 
So narrative generation, I think, is the name of the game. And uh, that is shaping global perceptions. Uh, but And in that, keeping your objectivity is perhaps the most, most difficult thing uh, for a scholar, uh, you know, of IR. So I'd like to end with Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, time is quite limited. So uh, I, I see here uh, so many questions and I try to, uh, you know, organize and uh, in, a, in a short minutes and uh, try to deliver uh, answers. So basically, uh, I agree uh, from uh, Dr. Rybier. You know, it, the narrative uh, conflict is uh, restructuring world, world formations or world order. Okay, U.S. lead alliance systems and China and and Chinese uh, alliance circles and it is quite restructured. Many countries are, are quite in between, so, <laughs> like Pakistan or South Korea. But you know, here a uh, very delicate situation because uh, not only your country, I mean, uh, the state uh, elites and uh, state structures, but also all these population individual is under, under, under attack, okay? So here, digital literacy is uh, quite important. You know, literacy is a uh, traditional literacy is uh, people uh, can read and write, but digital literacy is uh, different. Uh, people can still can read and write, but however, they don't read and write, or even though they read and write, uh, write, uh, they 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 read and, and watch. They don't understand, you know. So you have to raise awareness of uh, digital literacy among your population because population can be swayed by these uh, narratives. Okay, it's it's quite so. Basically, entire nation, not only state uh, or, or government structures, but also individuals, private citizens. Uh, quite uh, uh, aware of who you are, what we need. It really, it really, it really different uh, country to country. Okay, Pakistani situation is quite different from South Korea. We have uh, we share commonality, but we also have dif uh, differentialities. So your country and your publics need to know who you are, what we want, what is our best interest. Okay. Certainly, uh, you know, you don't want to be a, you know, U.S. better state, but because of that, you cannot take side with uh, China uh, old way. You know, your uh, information uh, communication structures, including internet, uh, maybe uh, uh, solely uh, controlled by China. That means you gonna be information colony. Okay. 21st uh, century colony is different from uh, 19th or 20th century. It's not just uh, you know old fashioned colony. 21st century is a colony of information. Internet, internet system, internet uh, uh, infrastructures are, are controlled by you know foreign foreign actors. That really uh, you know uh, quite scary. So basically, you have to calculate and you need to understand who, who you are and what you want, okay? Then we may share uh, tactics and technologies and you know, strategies. So narratives is quite important. You have to establish your own narratives. Then you need to fit with the US or, or China or other you know, narratives to find out your positioning in the, in the global order. That's what I think. And then this is more important because you know a kinetic warfare is not uh, gonna be a uh, uh, common uh, in in twenty uh, first century world war. Even though we observing you know Russian Ukrainian war, it, it's gonna be quite you know rare because you know cost is so great. So cognitive warfare is quite suitable uh, alternative options for these superpowers. I think. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. We have another question from uh, uh, the student Irfan Patapi. Um, uh, his question is, how do cognitive warfare and influence operation intersect with cyber warfare and traditional military strategy? I would like to answer this uh, question, if I may, Dr. Shah. Yes, sure, please. sure, sure. All right. So I think it's a great question. Uh, the intersection of cognitive warfare and influence operations with cyber warfare is, is significant. 
firstly. And as cyberspace has become a key arena for dissemination and manipulation of information, you need to watch this space, right? So cyber warfare, it involves the use of technology to disrupt, to damage, to destroy information systems, while cognitive warfare and influence operations, they involve the manipulation of information and perceptions. And the two are often used in tandem in order to achieve military objectives, and the combination of these tactics can be particularly effective. Traditional military strategy, I believe, also intersects with cognitive warfare and influence operations, as these techniques can be used to gain an advantage over an adversary on the battlefield. So by manipulating an adversary's perceptions, beliefs, behavior, a military force may be able to gain a tactical advantage or cause an adversary to make strategic mistakes. Additionally, I believe cognitive warfare and influence operations can be used to undermine an adversary's morale, for example, and create divisions within the enemy forces. However, I believe it is important to note that the use of cognitive warfare and influence operation, it also raises ethical concerns as these techniques involve deception and manipulation of people's beliefs in general. So the use of these tactics against civilians or non-combatants, they may be considered a violation of international law, but we have not reached that stage where this sort of legislation, uh, keeping in mind ethical concerns, you know, we have not reached there collectively um, as, as a global, uh, in the global space. Uh, it is important for military strategists, I believe, to con carefully consider the ethical implications of using cognitive warfare and influence operations to ensure that these techniques are used in a lawful and ethical manner. I hope this answers your question. Uh, for answering this question, uh, I'd like to give you uh, the examples. <laughs> So uh, let's imagine this, uh, you know, South, uh, North Korea uh, attacking South Korea. Uh, so war starts. Then, you know, North Korean hackers uh, hacking uh, our president or uh, some of the uh, uh, top generals, uh, you know, internet, and they found uh, quite scandalous uh, information. And then uh, they are spreading this uh, scandalous information to the public. How will this uh, negatively affect uh, public morale uh, to uh, supporting war against North Korea? Or maybe uh, they uh, use deep fake, uh, deep fake uh, uh, techniques. You know, uh, South Korean president or top generals, and they are maybe doing this. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, sexual, uh, you know, activities, and and then uh, on internet it, it become publicized. It's a DPEG, or maybe uh, there's a DPEG news. Uh, South Korean uh, president already, uh, you know, uh, escaped from South Korea and is in Hawaii. Uh, you you <laughs> maybe uh, our uh, South Korean public, uh, you know. Cyber warfare, uh, psychological warfare, uh, uh, cognitive warfare, uh, and kinetic warfare is all combined. You know, uh, 2016 Russian operation is quite a uh, great, you know, uh, good example uh, how cyber techn technological warfare is uh, combined with the cyber cognitive warfare. Uh, Russian hackers, uh, they are hacked, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton's email, and they found out quite scandalous information. And they relieved this information through, uh, you know, uh, leaking uh, expertized uh, websites, such as WikiLeaks and DCLeaks. Washington Post, the New York Times, you know, and, you know, they used this uh, leaking information and they publicized the article. And then, uh, you know, Russia leading these uh, comments, uh, uh, organized forces, uh, they are spreading this information throughout the public. It actually negatively affected the uh, consequence of uh, 2016 U.S. presidential election. Okay, it's a number of ways. It's all connect, uh, connected uh, uh, society. Back in 2014, uh, Russian military doctrine, they even, uh, you know, addressing uh, 
they're gonna put the disinformation weapons in, in uh, on in satellite in in space. So it's all connected now and now more and more connected. So uh, you really have to understand this, uh, you know, uh, nature of uh, future warfare. Thank you. Uh, we have um, number. Yeah, please, Sarah, sorry, yeah. Dr. Shah. So uh, I've just answered in the interest of time. Just uh, posted my answer to one of the questions. I think there is one question posted by Ali Jafri for Professor Yoon, uh, and then you can wrap up. Thank you. Yes, sure, sure, please. Uh, I couldn't read the the uh, the question from Ali Jafri. Uh, If, if someone can please uh, unmute Ali Jafri uh, so that I can, he can... I can read that question. Yes, sure, please. Yeah. Please. please. Um, so, so Ali is saying that uh, how do actors at the receiving end of cyber warfare deter cyber aggressors who deny attribution? So basically referring to the attribution issue, which is so critical. So uh, Professor Yoon, this question is great. Attribution is quite... Uh you know, typical uh, process. So it, it's, it's extremely difficult. So investigation is quite, uh, you know, uh, problematic. So that's why it, this is a quite, you know, uh, more dangerous because in, in the time of war, you know, we don't have quite, uh, you know, enough time to respond. So uh, you need to uh, focus on strategy each uh, actors, uh, countries, what they want, you know, what is their main goal, okay? Then that gives you an idea, okay? In, in, the, in, the, in the time of peace, you know, you have enough time to investigate, but in the time of war, you, you know, you need to take different measures. So it's an emergency or a non-emergency, and then you can take different measures. In the, in the time of emergency, you may uh, more emphasize human rights and uh, you know rule of law and law and order and things like that. So you may uh, uh, spend more uh, time and effort to, to uh, identify attributions. But in case of war, you know war, and you know you need to take extra ordinary measures. That's what what we can do, I think. And you really need to focus on this. Uh, you know, a, a, you know, emerging technologies and uh, you know this uh, integration between the human actors and uh, non-human actors and AIs. I mean, AIs are always in this, so it's, it's quite difficult. But we work. We have to work on this. Thank you. So um, with this, uh, we are going to wrap up uh, today's. Uh, uh, webinar and uh, uh, with the once again thank you Professor Yoon and Professor Akhtar. Um, I would also like to thank uh, President IRS, uh, Ms. Rima Shokat, uh, IRS uh, technical staff and the students uh, who had been here uh, for sparing out uh, the time out of your busy schedules. Uh, I hope that we'll be having a future session uh, with uh, again uh, Professor Dr. Rabi Akhtar uh, and Professor Mino Yun, uh, with my for my students, uh, and I, you'll be delivering a scholarly lecture. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Pleasure thank you very much. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.